best place to be is here. And uh, so very happy to all be here. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, thank you, Geshema, for your kindness. We really mean it every week. Every week, uh, we're sincerely appreciative very much. We're very, very fortunate. Okay, thank you. All. Okay, thank you, Laura. All right, so let's take a moment to prepare our mind with the meditation, starting with mindfulness of the breath. And since there's no place where the Buddha doesn't exist, the mind of the Buddha doesn't exist, so visualize the Buddha in the space in front of you. Very calmly. Seated in the Vajra position, wearing the robes of a monk. And then think that the Buddha is surrounded by all the great beings of the different traditions, in particular of the Nalanda tradition. And by the masters of Tibet. Just feel their presence, even if they don't clearly appear to you. And generate a sense of joy and gratitude. The fact that we have all these great examples of outstanding practitioners guiding and inspiring us. And then since we're doing this, not just for our own benefit, but for the benefit of all sentient beings, visualize that you're surrounded by each one of them. Desperately needing help, being lost in samsara and its trappings. Constantly under the control of their self-centeredness and self-grasping. And 
And then they're aware of the fact that all of them have the potential to become fully enlightened, thus generate affectionate love towards each one of these beings. A deep sense of care and affection. while accepting them even for all their shortcomings and all their faults. Knowing that these cause them endless sufferings. And then particularly focusing on sentient beings suffering and its causes generate great compassion. Again, focusing on all sentient beings and generating the aspiration. May they be free from all their suffering and its causes. And the aspiration, may I be able to protect them from their suffering? May I be able to lead them to a state of liberation where they're free from their suffering and its causes? So hold on to that aspiration while continuing to experience this deep affection towards each one of them. And then allow your great compassion to become even stronger. And so it gives way to the altruistic attitude, a determination to do whatever is necessary to lead sentient beings to a state free from suffering and its causes. To take personal responsibility for the well being of all sentient beings. But since we can effectively only do so once we reach the awakened state of a Buddha, let's generate bodhicitta, the aspiration to become fully enlightened for the benefit, for the welfare of all sentient beings. And think that it's also with this aspiration, with this determination that we'll continue to study Chandrakirti's entry into the middle way. And 
to further deepen our motivation and accumulate merit, let's first cite the prayers. We go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. And focusing in particular on the object of refuge, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas in the space in front of us, reverently a prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time. and rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of cyclic existence and turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own merits and those of others to the great enlightenment. Okay. All right. Just a sec. Okay, so we won't have any questions today. Um, but next week I'll, I'll have some so we can right away dive into the text oh no first of course first very important for you what to do this following week uh, and of course it is bodhicitta 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 uh, even if I may sound like a broken record because I keep saying it but all I can do is just remind you of it over and over again and I trust your understanding of the mind of enlightenment is uh, sufficient that you could do this practice. And of course, if you have some time to read, for instance, Shantideva's Bodhisattva Chayatara, uh, the commentaries, there are quite a few commentaries available. So in that way to support your practice and to remember not to leave anyone out. 
I've said that on many occasions, and especially with the current situation, the situation of the war and so forth, it's easy to generate hatred, to generate aversion towards particular people. But to also remember that whatever these people do right now, and however horrible and, and, uh, and well, beyond understanding it may be, it comes out of self-grasping, self-cherishing, and creates incredible suffering for themselves. And even right now, it leads to a sense of isolation and fear and loneliness and so forth. So not a state we ourselves would like to be in. And so to generate compassion for them without approving, of course, of their actions. We're not approving of the actions. We don't approve of them. We don't condone them but we see the human being behind that. So to really make an effort, and of course, towards those who are suffering right now so greatly, so to open our heart towards them, to think of them whenever we, well, remember. But to also, and we started doing this last time, to bring in, well, this being part of the method aspect, of course, love, compassion, which then leads to this, determination this aspiration to become fully enlightened based on that deep care and love for sentient beings but doing so based uh, well together with or conjoined with wisdom so we can't have both in one mind at least not in the sutric uh, as part of the sutric practice which this is so method and wisdom can never be one mind but we can join them we can conjoin them in that, well, for instance, you generate the mind of enlightenment and then take the wisdom aspect and what I suggested last time, and we'll continue through different uh, concepts, we we'll go through different concepts, but for now, it's impermanence. So focusing on all sentient beings, focusing on their suffering, generating the mind of enlightenment, and then without totally letting go of that mind. So... Of course, the mind may not be, well, it's no longer present because now you switch to a different mind. So what you focus on is then the impermanence of sentient beings, focusing on the constant changing nature of all sentient beings. And then go back to bodhicitta and go back, go alternate between those two and alternate in that way between method and wisdom so that your bodhicitta your mind of enlightenment is also influenced, is conjoined, which means it's influence. It gets influenced by your understanding of the impermanence of your main focus, which are sentient beings. This is usually done with great compassion. Well, it's you have compassion that just focuses on sentient beings. And then, as I said last time, compassion, which focuses on Dharma. So the three types of compassion, uh, the, the third type, is compassion that focuses on the non-observable, if you like, or the focuses on emptiness. But of course, it's not really compassion itself that does so. It's just these two minds alternating between compassion and, well, an understanding of dharma, which in this case, dharma here means the impermanence or other uh, facts, or focusing on uh, emptiness, in the case of the third compassion, where again, you have to generate compassion and then generate an understanding of emptiness or as far as you can go with that and then go back to compassion. So here we're not doing it with great compassion. We're doing it with bodhicitta, which works in the same way. So generate bodhicitta and then your focus being sentient beings, their well-being, uh, your own enlightenment, but of course for the welfare of all sentient beings and focus on sentient beings, their impermanence, focusing on, um, well, even the suffering, the suffering that they experience right now, that that is changing, that that is going out of existence and so forth. So really bringing the two together. And with impermanence, um, last time um, I said, well, focus on horse impermanence, Compermanence that we can notice in that, well, they're going to die one day or the suffering they have right now will be there one day, but it will go on the next day. It's, it's changing. So focusing more on the obvious change, but 
for this week, I'd like you to focus more on the subtle change. I did mention it last time, but more specifically, become aware that sentient beings, their minds, their body, and we're included in sentient beings, of course, constantly changing. There is no phenomenon, there's no impermanent phenomenon that is the same from moment to moment. It may appear to us that way, but we ourselves, our body is constantly changing. Our mind is constantly changing. It's never the same from one moment to the next. And if that's the case, well, we can say with certainty the person is changing. And everything around us, the environment, situation, they may seem very similar. I mean, we see the sun every day. Well, not every day, but, you know, when it's not cloudy, we see the sun and it seems to be the same, but it has changed. Everything that is the sun is made of, it's it's particles it's it's atoms the molecules everything is changing constantly so it looks the same but it's not the same and to become really aware of that nature of the things around us that they're in constant motion that they're never the same changing moment by moment so do that focus on that and then go back to bodhicitta so alternating between the two enlightenment changing moment by moment the person who's enlightened your own enlightenment you own future buddha changing moment by moment doesn't mean that it becomes become a totally different person just saying the mind is changing the body is changing these phenomena have been created by causes and conditions and therefore they keep changing but in particular your own environment sentient beings etc so to really focus on subtle impermanence, which is extremely helpful to also understanding emptiness, because if something is constantly changing, how can it have some essential nature that exists within the object or exists in and of the object itself or from the side of the object? Okay, so this is what I'd like you to do, bodhicitta and subtle impermanence for, for this coming week. And then we can go back to the text um well a few words i'd like to say about the part we're now going through as you probably remember when we started studying entering into the middle way when we started studying this text we were made aware and this is just the way it's usually studied studied as part of the introduction to chandrakirti's text that this is a commentary of course on nagajunas fundamental wisdom or Mula Majamika Karika. But the reason we're studying this is that it's not just explaining, it's not just um, clarifying some of these difficult points that are set forth in Nagarjuna's text, but it's also a type of supplement. That's why the entering into the middle way, sometimes the title in English is supplement to the middle way, which is not a literal translation of the uh, the Sanskrit or the Tibetan title, but rather it conveys the meaning of this, this text or what this text is all about, that not only does it set forth emptiness as a commentary explicitly on, or so like an explicit commentary on Nagarjuna's text, but it also supplements Nagarjuna's explanation on emptiness with other uh, ideas, with other philosophical concepts and part of those are the grounds and path it it presents the path well that we need to follow of course not as extensively as it presents emptiness but it nonetheless does and this becomes clear this becomes obvious in the part we're studying right now it sets forth in particular the path of medit the path of seeing and the path of meditation so We've already, I mean, as you remember, this text, Chandakirti's text, here, this entering into the middle way has 11 chapters. And of those 10, of those 11, the first 10, and right now we're, we're basically studying, well, the eighth chapter today. Um, of those, the first 10 describe each one of the 10 grounds or 10 levels which in turn correspond to the 10 perfections. So each chapter, first chapter is generosity. The first ground, 
no, joyous one, as it's called, which corresponds to the first of the ten perfections, which is generosity. So what are the ten perfections? The first six are the uh, six perfections as we know them, generosity, ethical morality or ethical discipline, and all the way to the sixth perfection, which is wisdom. And then you have four more perfections, which is the perfection of skillful means, of aspiration, of um, power, and of primordial or exalted wisdom. A slightly different type of wisdom than the wisdom that is the sixth perfection. Okay. Now, that being the case, we've gone through all these chapters. And since this text is a commentary, as I said, on specifically Nagarjuna's uh, fundamental wisdom, which deals mainly with emptiness. So emptiness is most expensive, extensively described in the sixth chapter, which is very fitting because the sixth chapter uh, deals with the perfection of wisdom. And so, uh, therefore, as part of the object of wisdom, emptiness is described very extensively. So now we're going through this, we've done this, um, and we're going back to the path. Okay, so the first five chapters already there, you may remember, we went through the first five perfections, and we didn't talk much of emptiness. It was mentioned every now and then, but we mainly focused on the path on the method aspect. And now, having finished the sixth chapter, um, we'll go back to the um, method aspect. Okay, so the different path, method, not just method, I mean the different path. All right, so just to remind you. And of course, when I said, when I say these 10 grounds correspond to each of the perfections, to correspond to one perfection, then what it's saying is that on each of these grounds, one of these perfections is exceeding, becomes more exceeding. It excels. The practitioner excels in that particular perfection. So on the first ground, it's generosity. A practitioner, a bodhisattva, excels in the practice of generosity. And then all the way to the sixth ground, wisdom excels in the practice of wisdom, then excels in the practice of skillful means and so forth. Okay, but more very important also, like I said before, this text, by way of describing these 10 perfections and thereby the 10 grounds, um, it basically also describes the path of seeing and the path of meditation. So it's, it's kind of and you'll see this becomes more obvious with the 11th chapter in particular, it's kind of a study also on grounds and path. Not as extensively as you would study it when you study the, the topic more, more um, extensively as like a separate topic, but still you, you gain quite a lot of information on the different qualities that are attained. And it doesn't take that long. It's difficult sometimes uh, to fully understand it, and there's not that much explanation given anyway. Uh, but still, it's, it's really helpful to get a sense of what these grounds are all about. And really, when it comes to the path that leads to enlightenment, the two most important ones are the path of seeing and the path of meditation, because that's when things are really happening. So the path of accumulation, the path of preparation, which are the first two levels, once you become a bodhisattva, of course, they can also be subdivided, um, just as the path of seeing and the path of meditation are subdivided. But it's not there's not that much information given as opposed to or as in, in comparison with the path of seeing and the path of meditation. Why? Because as I said, really stuff stuff that's the changes, profound changes are really taking place once you reach the path of seeing. Why? Because you realize emptiness directly. You have a direct experience of emptiness, which for a lot of people, there's often the misunderstanding that once you realize emptiness directly, you're okay. You're, you're liberated. You're out of, you know, you've attained liberation. That's, of course, not true. It's only just starting. It's kind of like, it's kind of like you've, you've, you've just gotten the vacuum cleaner that enables you to overcome all the obstructions in your mind. All right. So you have discussed this way. I've mentioned this on, on a few occasions that 
the two goals that we're talking about as part of Buddhist practice, liberation and even more important, importantly, enlightenment. Reaching these states, attaining these states is much less about gaining new qualities, but rather about eliminating things in our mind, obstructions in our mind that are not part of our mind, they're not on the nature of our mind, and they shouldn't be there. And just because they're there, we suffer. And we can remove them because they're not actually in the nature of our mind. And becoming enlightened is really becoming liberated. Becoming enlightened is really about removing what's extra in our mind, what is not in the nature of our mind, removing this. And once those are removed, you first remove the obstructions to liberation, afflictive obstructions, as they're called. So that which keeps us from being liberated. And then you eliminate even more you overcome even more which is described as well the obstructions that prevent us from becoming enlightened or also described as cognitive obscurations cognitive obstructions so these are being eliminated once you do this once you get rid of them then the other qualities will follow naturally of course in that process the process of even reaching the state when you start eliminating them, you do gain qualities. It's not like you don't gain new qualities. But as I said, although that is the case, really Buddhist practice, practice towards with a goal of liberation and enlightenment is eventually or ultimately it's all about removing that which is not supposed to be there. So when do you start removing this? When do you really start removing obscurations, that is, faults and limitations that prevent you from being liberated and from being enlightened. When you start doing that, you start doing that on the path of seeing. So before those two levels, path of seeing and path of meditation, before you attain the path of seeing, um, on the lower levels, and even before you enter the path, enter any of these levels, well, you do reduce them. You reduce them. Of course, you can reduce them. And that's what we're trying to do even right now, try to become aware of them, reduce them, make sure they don't arise as frequently, not with the same strength as they well like to arise sometimes or as they tend to arise sometimes. So just to reduce them. But And we can even, on top of that, we can even attain certain states of concentration that enable us to temporarily eliminate these obscurations so that as long as you have a particular concentration, certain afflictions, certain delusions, such as anger, cannot arise. But they're not totally eliminated because when we lose that concentration, which happens can happen of course um when we lose that when it when it when we lose it because we become too distracted or what have you whatever are the reasons then these uh afflictions these delusions that were temporarily gone maybe for i don't know many years many lifetimes even they come back however once you reach the path of seeing you have the ability to totally eliminate them so that they can never come back Like I said, it's with your direct realization of emptiness. That is the tool. That's like the vacuum cleaner, to use an analogy or a metaphor. So like a vacuum cleaner gets rid of dust that shouldn't be there, that's, well, potentially harmful. Likewise, the mind that realizes emptiness directly, directly, um, it eliminates. It's like a vacuum cleaner that eliminates dust. It eliminates these different obscurations. And it's a type of mind, it's a type of consciousness, but of course these obscurations are found in the mind. So it's not surprising that you need a particular type of mind that can overcome particular mental obscurations. And that is the mind that realizes emptiness, realizes uh, how phenomena really are, which is a direct antidote to the root of all our obscurations, to all our faults and limitations. So if you get rid of the root, obviously you get rid of all the faults that this root potentially gives rise to. 
So realizing emptiness directly, you start actually eliminating these obscurations. And of course, initially, just as a, I don't know, vacuum cleaner in that case may not be the best example. Uh, but uh, yeah, actually, in a certain way, it is because if you first, you know, you, you vacuum clean the floor first, the bigger pieces that are easily removed, they are easily sucked up. And if you go over a carpet, for instance, the, if you remain for a long time, then even the deeper levels of dust are sucked up. So, so similarly here, when you realize emptiness directly, um, it's like initially you only overcome some of the coarser kind of obscurations that are easily, relatively easily removed in comparison to the other ones. So step by step, you remove deeper and deeper levels of obscurations. And very important, you can't do so in one go. It's not like you enter a direct realization of emptiness and you remain in that state until you become enlightened. No way, it's not going to work. You can't remain in that state. So you enter into that state and you need to come out of it again. So basically, there are two phases, phases, P-H-A-S-E-S, so phases, stages, if you like, on the path of seeing, on the path of meditation. So there are these two stages, two periods, periods when a bodhisattva is in the direct realization or direct realization of emptiness and the period or the state, the phase when the bodhisattva is out of this, which is not absorbed into this direct realization of emptiness, two phases. During the absorption, during the direct absorption, the bodhisattva can eliminate step by step the different obscurations. First, the obscurations to liberation, and then the obscurations to enlightenment. Okay. But the bodhisattva comes out of them, has to come out of them, has to come out of them in order to accumulate, to practice method to practice the method aspect of the path, love, compassion, the mind of enlightenment. It seems like when you hear a bodhisattva has attained the mind of enlightenment, it seems like that's it. Wants to become enlightened, wishes to be, aspires to be enlightened and never go, looks back at this mind. But it's not like that. That mind needs to be deepened and strengthened further. I mean, aspiration has so many levels. It's very difficult to put it into words it's become stronger. How strong is it now? It's this strong. It's that strong. I mean, it's easy to talk about how strong a car is, you know, like how, how many kilos it can pull, for instance, if you talk strength or how strong a person's body is, can lift, I don't know, 10 kilo, 20 kilo, whatever. It's very difficult to talk about the strength of bodhicitta. How do you measure it? Uh, but the point is, so that is difficult to do. But the point is that what as a bodhisattva, until Buddhahood, their love, their compassion, their bodhicitta, their generosity, all that needs to be strengthened. And when do they do that? Not when they're absorbed in the meditative equipoise, directly realizing emptiness. Once they reach the path of seeing, they're able to realize emptiness directly. No, but these other minds that are described method, they're described as the practices of method, the method practices, not wisdom, method versus wisdom. So those can only be practiced when they rise from that meditative equipoise and deepen their love and deepen their compassion and so forth, which in turn influences the wisdom realizing emptiness. Okay. It makes that makes that wisdom stronger. And here again, at how do you measure that strength? It's still realizing emptiness directly. With regard to that, it's the same. But it's still strengthened by love and compassion. Strengthened to such a degree that initially, while on the path, when you first, when the Bodhisattva first reaches the path of seeing, they can only overcome with the direct realization of emptiness. So let's say they enter, they enter into the direct realization of emptiness. For the first time, they only eliminate coarser levels of, well, first of all, the obstructions to liberation. So coarser levels of self-grasping. Those that 
were intellectually acquired, that we were not born with, that the Bodhisattva was not born with, that were acquired during this lifetime, these wrong views with regard to the self and other phenomena, those are eliminated then, but not more. The mind is not strong enough to eliminate more. So the Bodhisattva has to rise from that and accumulate more merit, generate more love, compassion, and so forth before he or she enters again into that direct absorption and is now able to eliminate um, even innate afflictions. And then first the coarser ones and then all the way up to the last level of the path of meditation when they uh, enter once again into a meditative absorption where they now eliminate the subtlest obscurations, the subtlest obscuration, and this time the obscurations to Buddhahood, because the ones on to liberations were already eliminated, and then they become a Buddha. So step by step, they eliminate these obscurations. So that's important to understand. And in that way, we talk of the path of seeing and the path of meditation. Um, in general, saying on the path of seeing, a person elimin a Bodhisattva eliminates the intellectually acquired um, afflictive obscurations or the obscurations that prevent his or her liberation. And then on the path of meditation starts with the innate ones and then step by step goes all the way, having eliminated the innate um, afflictive obscurations and then starting to eliminate step by step the um, the obscurations to enlightenment where you don't have intellectually acquired ones or innate ones there's no distinctions in that way but there's still coarser and subtler levels and this step-by-step -step pro process is described by way of the 10 boomies the first boomy the first ground the first yeah well ground or level if you want to call it um, starts on the path of seeing so simply explains them in a simple fashion so the first ground and the first and the path of seeing they're the same and then the second ground starts on the path of meditation and so really the path of meditation can be subdivided in the second ground third ground fourth ground so it doesn't start with the first ground but the second ground third ground and so forth all the way up to the tenth ground and as we go through these chapters of um, Chandakirti's text, well, we're going through these 10 grounds. So basically we go through the path of seeing and the path of meditation. All right. So I hope this kind of um, information is helpful. In particular, the fact that they, once they reach the path of seeing, that is once they realize emptiness directly, so the first time they realize emptiness directly, that is also the first moment of the path of seeing. That that's when they start to eliminate what is in the way to first liberation and then enlightenment. Of course, their goal is enlightenment. And so the fact that they also overcome the obscurations to liberation is not done because that's what they're aiming for. But it's simply because you can't get rid of the obscurations to enlightenment if you do not first eliminate or get rid of the obscurations to liberation. Okay. All right. So I hope this is, gives you kind of a, so it's just a, a, a summary of the, the grounds and path, basically, especially the grounds, well, especially the path of seeing and path of meditation described from the point of view of the grounds or the boomies, the, 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 those 10 levels. All right. Now we got to, so just quickly, just to quickly go over it, we talked about the sixth ground at the very end. Okay. So I just briefly go through uh, these verses without explaining them. So what does Chantakirti tell us in verse 224, the last three verses? So he's basically saying, Having illuminated, so the Bodhisattva illuminated by the rays of wisdom's light. So this wisdom the Bodhisattva has attained, which was developed in dependence on analysis. This is what was different between the wisdom on the sixth ground and the exalted wisdom. The exalted wisdom on the tenth ground, it's more an intuition, uh, like it's a more uh, an 
a deeper kind of wisdom that of course needs to be preceded by the wisdom on the sixth ground. And the wisdom on the sixth ground, that's a kind of wisdom that arises a dependence on analysis and then a realization of emptiness and then a direct experience of emptiness. It, it's the direct experience of emptiness is preceded by just a conceptual understanding of emptiness and that is preceded by analysis. Anyway, so we're still with the sixth ground on which a bodhisattva excels in the practice of wisdom, which arises from analysis. So that was developed. Therefore, the rays of wisdom's light were developed in dependence on an analysis of the explanations that Chandakirti gave in the beginning of the sixth chapter, all the way to verse 200, well, from verse one of the sixth chapter to verse 223. So based on that understanding, then a bodhisattva on the sixth level attains this special well wisdom understanding of emptiness or direct realization which is like a light because it eliminates the darkness of ignorance and the bodhisattvas once realizing emptiness directly therefore on on this level well actually before already because it's the sixth level on the first level has already realized but like i said excels excels in the in the understanding of emptiness it's a a deeper understanding of emptiness where uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, excels in the, the wisdom that realizes emptiness. So the emptiness is the same, but there's a special quality to it, which is not, which is not explained. So at that stage, the Bodhisattva sees clearly as one sees a gooseberry in one's open palm, as one sees a strawberry or, well, a gooseberry is good enough, uh, a malaki berry, this particular Indian um, um, fruit or berry, just as if that was lying on one's hand, the Bodhisattva sees the emptiness of the three realms of samsara. So in their entirety, realizing that from the very beginning, they were not inherently born, that they do not inherently exist, and they do not inherently get out of, get out of existence, so that nothing exists inherently. It's not inherently born, that's not inherently remain and does not inherently get out of existence and that was always the case also it is through the force of the conventional truth in particular the method aspect love and compassion and so forth that now that the bodhisattva then journeys that is moves closer to the cessation of all mental obstructions okay so this is what 224 tells us and so here he brings in he brings in uh the conventional truth in particular in the form of the method then it goes on to say in 225, so through the mind, so though the mind of a bodhisattva on the sixth ground may rest continuously in, in, in cessation, well, cessation in the literal sense of having already overcome some coarser levels of obstructions. He started on the, he or she started on the path of meditation. So already certain obstructions were eliminated. Um, so from that point of view, rests in those cessations or cessation in the sense of emptiness, rests in emptiness, realizes, has realized emptiness directly. So even when having arisen from that meditative active poise, um, the Bodhisattva is still aware, is still influenced by that direct realization. He also generates, so not just resting in, in, in cessation the way just described, he or she also generates compassion for beings bereft of protection. I mean, all sentient beings having no protection. They're, they're, they're exposed to their own self-grasping. In this way, bodhisattvas remain in both nirvana and samsara to a certain degree. Remain in nirvana, the cessation, and samsara, which is, well, sentient beings suffering. So when the bodhisattva then advances further, that is to the next level or the seventh level, he or she will also outshine through his wisdoms all those born from the Buddha speech, that is hear us, as well as middle Buddhas or solid who realize us. Because that is on the seventh level, which will be explained later on with the next chapter, will be explained that, well, in the seventh chapter, the Bodhisattva is able to enter into a meditative absorption and come out of it just within a single moment. So the, the agility of the mind, the ability of the mind is so great that because the bodhisattva excels in wisdom on the sixth level, that exceeding perfection of wisdom that the bodhisattva attains enables the bodhisattva on the next level to be able to exit and enter into this absorption in such a short period of time. 
And whereas previously, the fact that a Bodhisattva realizes emptiness and realizes emptiness directly, just from the point of view of realizing emptiness, in that from that re, in, in that regard, he does not outshine heroes and solitary realizers, those who merely aim for self liberation. But this ability, okay, of course, in terms of method, love, and compassion, he outshines uh, those practitioners. But in terms of wisdom, there's no difference. But from the seventh ground onwards, which is the next level, this wisdom, because of this ability, this agility of the mind to enter and exit within that one moment, in that, in that regard, the wisdom of the Bodhisattva outshines the wisdom of heroes and solitary realizers. So um, it's not so much about like a competition, oh, I'll shine them, but just saying, wow, from then onwards, really, the Bodhisattva's qualities are ex exceeding greatly. And it makes sense that the mind of the Bodhisattva, the vacuum cleaner, the realization of emptiness, that direct, well, the direct realization of emptiness can remove more than a hero of solitude realize I can, can remove. That is also the obstructions to, to, to enlightenment because that mind is more agile. The mind is, has greater abilities, greater power. Of course, strengthened by love and compassion, but still it's a different type of mind is the direct realization of emptiness. Okay, so that being the case, it tells us here, verse 225 is just telling us, well, because of this special exceeding perfection of wisdom on the sixth level, the Bodhisattva will in the, on the seventh level be able to outshine heroes and solitary realizers. So that's what verse 225 tells us. All right. And then 226, it's this example or the analogy of the Bodhisattva on the sixth level being like a king of swans. And last time I mentioned, it's also, in, it's, they say it's to do with that. Or in some commentary, or my, one of my teachers explained it, he said that here the king of swans uh, it's like the story of the Jataka tale story number 22, where it talks about the Bodhisattva who's like a king of swans, or who was a king of swans. So here it's kind of compared to that. This, this is where this comes from. So the Bodhisattva, I don't know, but that's what remember my teacher used to say. So anyway, the Bodhisattva on the sixth level is like a king of swans who soars ahead of other accomplished swans, that is of other practitioners of lesser realizations. And the Bodhisattva does so by spreading wide, by spreading wide or applying his wide wing of conventional truth. So the different path, the method aspects and so forth. And his wide wing of ultimate truth. So the two wings of method and wisdom of conventional and ultimate truth. And is propelled by the powerful winds of virtue that he accumulated in the past and continues to accumulate in the future or right now. And so propelled in this way, so the Bodhisattva um, then cruises from the shore of samsara and even nirvana to the excellent far shore of enlightenment and thus to the oceanic qualities of the conqueror. Okay, so he moves first towards nirvana, of course, but then even further towards the other shore, which is enlightenment. That's what we've learned on with the last uh, three verses. So since it's so important, this on this mentions them again and again, quotes them again and again uh, during his teachings. For the last two, three years, his homeless has yeah, quoted them a lot. Um, I'm thought to go over them again and not hard to understand. And then we then moved on last time to the seventh ground. So the ground called Ganefa, where, as I said before, um, the Bodhisattva excels in skillful means. Okay, skillful means mean being in particular like in his interaction with disciples, with other people, presenting the Dharma, talking to them. So being skillful, um, yeah, well, in his uh, guiding, guiding other beings. So here it says on the seventh ground, which is called the gone afar, okay, gone afar, especially in terms of wisdom, where as we've heard on this level, the Bodhisattva outshines those heroes and Bodhisattva. But so, um, Solito realizes those on the uh, path to self liberation, outshines them through wisdom. So, gone afar, therefore, the Bodhisattva outshines those um, instantly and within a single moment. 
he is able, he or she is able to enter and exit the cessation or the direct realization of emptiness. So on this ground, therefore, um, oh, so, uh, so sorry, on this ground, so they, they are able to do that. But also, as I just said, they're able to exceed with regard to the practice of um, skillful means. So become particularly skillful. That's all that the seventh um, chapter tells us. It describes the seventh ground. And as I said later on, we hear a little bit more about in the uh, in the eleventh chapter. The qualities of the different grounds are summarized. So we hear a little bit more about it. But that's all it is telling us about the seventh ground. And then you have the last three grounds, which are also described as the three pure grounds. So. You have the eighth ground, which is called the immovable. Immovable in the sense that from that ground onwards, but it's, about it's no longer moved, it's no longer controlled by self-grasping, by the misapprehension of reality. Why? Because on the eighth ground, the bodhisattva reaches the cessation of all um, aspirations to liberation. So in other words, the bodhisattva reaches liberation. Um, it's not called self-liberation because that wasn't the goal of the Bodhisattva in the first place. It just happens to be such that if you eliminate, in order to eliminate the obscurations to liberation, you need to first eliminate the obscurations to, no, sorry, in order to eliminate the obscurations to enlightenment, you need to first eliminate the obscurations to liberation. There's no way around that. But that wasn't the actual goal of the Bodhisattva. So it's just a, a side effect, if you like, or it's just what you need to do in order to um, uh, attain liberation, uh, in order to attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. So you have to go through all these different levels. Okay, so first the path of seeing, that's when you eliminate, um, you eliminate um, intellectually acquired, the first ground or the the path of seeing, you eliminate uh, intellectually acquired um, afflictive obscurations or obscurations to liberation. And then you move on to the path of seeing with the second ground. And slowly, first the coarser levels, again and again, like I said, in these alternating meditative regular poise, eliminate a certain level of uh, afflictive obscurations, come out of it, accumulate merit, practice the other. Uh, practice method and so forth and go back into it when the time has come go back into the do enter again into the uh, meditative um, equipoise again eliminate a slightly subtler level of the innate um, afflictive obscuration come out of it do something else and so forth so all the way to the seventh ground and now on the eighth level the bodhisattva enters into the meditative equipoise once again, and that meditative act of voice that now eliminates the subtlest le level, the subtlest level of afflictive obscurations, that is, obscurations that, that prevent liberation. That is the eighth ground, by definition, that is the eighth ground. So the Bodhisattva enters that meditative act of voice and is now on the eighth ground and eliminates now on that eighth ground, eliminates um, these obscurations the subtlest ones. Okay, so if you look at the first verse of chapter number eight, to attain again and again virtues and so forth, is one of those verses that have five lines instead of um, four. Most of them have four lines, but this one has two, three, five. Yeah, five lines in Tibetan. Um, so that's why in English, it's, in the translation is called also five. So in order to attain again and again virtues and qualities that are superior to the earlier ones, Okay, so why is this said? Why, why, does, why is this line? Well, because the Bodhisattva is not stopping there. The Bodhisattva will not stop at attaining the eighth ground from the sixth, seventh, reaching the seventh ground or the eighth ground. No, there's more work to be done. So the goal is really not just liberation, but full enlightenment. So the Bodhisattva has to attain again and again greater virtues that are superior to the earlier ones. So the great being on the seventh level then will enter the eighth level and continue from there. So the eighth level, the great being the Bodhisattva, on the seventh, seventh level will then enter the eighth level, the immovable, which is called the immovable. 
Okay, it's also a state of irreversibility because you eliminate, you overcome samsara. You've totally overcome samsara. So it's on that state, the Bodhisattva eliminates the subtlest innate afflictive obstructions, the subtlest obstructions to liberation. Okay, so um, this is what these first three lines tell us. Well, implied in that attains now the cessation and his aspirations become the ten of the ten perfections. So the ten perfections is now the perfection of aspiration. What does aspiration mean? Skillful means we explained the other six perfection you're more familiar with. Aspiration here is just another word for saying prayer. Now, prayer, the way we look at prayer is often the words that we speak. That is described as prayer. But real prayer is a mental process where we pray, we aspire towards something. May I, may beings just by seeing me feel happier and overcome or have less problems, for instance. Like that would be a prayer, a bodhisattva, uh, or an aspiration the bodhisattva has. So to a certain degree, you can say bodhicitta, love, compassion, they're all aspirations. So in a way, they're a prayer, if you like. Um, so prayer here, like I said, it's not really prayer as in the, in the way we think of uh, in the West, like we think of the words, etc. Like even when we do the prayer before class, the, the words are not the prayer. The words help us to be mindful of the meaning. So to aspire to become enlightened, to take refuge, etc. It's all a mental state to aspire towards, um, well, the Dharma, to rely on the Dharma, uh, the, the, the Buddha who teaches the Dharma and so forth. So through taking refuge, it's a kind of aspiration. It's a kind of prayer, which the mental state is, 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 is the main aspiration main focus but in particular what do bodhisattvas aspire is the well-being of others it's it's their main aspiration is to benefit others and that becomes stronger and it becomes uh, well deeper more forceful this aspiration this aspiring mind just wishing for others so and and the bodhisattva exceeds with this aspiration because the fulfillment of this aspiration is much more uh, rapid on that state in comparison to on the first ground. I mean, if we have aspirations, it, it'll probably take a while until these aspirations um, we have to accumulate the causes and conditions, of course. We aspire, I don't know, to be able to go to university, etc. So we have to create the causes and conditions. The aspiration is the first step, but then, of course, uh, generate the causes and or to accumulate the causes and conditions to be able to go to university. So just having the wish, of course, is not sufficient. So that is true, of course, also for our bodhisattva, but a bodhisattva, because of this incredible virtue they have already accumulated and they continue to accumulate, on that level, the strength of their mind is such that if they aspire, so their aspirations are always directed towards the benefit of other sentient beings. So like I said before, um, an aspiration like may beings just merely by seeing me forget their worries, right? That's definitely um, an aspiration. May beings just seeing my body accumulate virtue. All these aspirations that, bodhisatt that bodhisattvas make, they're the reason for the fact that we say, Perceiving a Buddha's statue or a, a, a Buddha's body. And so a Buddha statue is really just symbolic for a Buddha's body. But seeing a Buddha statue and perceiving it to be a Buddha actually has a positive effect on our mind and can lead us to create virtue. Just that. That is through the power of the aspirations. It's not just there's something inherent in a, in, in a certain statue or an image of the Buddha. But no, it's... Um, of course, our own mind, what we associate with that to a certain degree is that, but also what it does on top of it is the, the prayers, these aspirations that the Buddhas have made. Therefore, certain places, even like Bogaya, uh, where the enlightenment took place, seeing certain statues, that's the reason why. And this aspiration is most powerful or excels on this eighth ground. Okay, so it's really important. That's why th there are these, these prayers. And, and one of my favorite is exactly that. When you say, may just be seeing me 
people feel better. And are there examples of beings where that is the case? Well, look at the lamas. I mean, honestly, if as soon as the Dalai Lama comes into a room, I mean, of course, there's anticipation and you look forward to it. But even if you weren't anticipating it and you would suddenly, I don't know, walk through Tel Aviv and let's say the visit of his holiness was kept a secret and suddenly you, you're, I don't know, on Yitzhak Rabid Square. That's the only square I remember right now. So you're standing there and there's his holiness. How, how are you going to feel in that moment? Right? Oh, right. It's going to be like, whoa, why is that? Well, part of that is. Of course, his wholeness has great qualities, but part of it is also the aspiration. The aspiration that his wholeness has also made. May my mere presence, and that's a typical one, so it's not like his wholeness is unique in that. No, my mere presence give sentient beings some peace of mind. May it move them. May it shake them up, you know, in a, in a spiritual way. And that's exactly what happens. And wouldn't it be lovely if you walked on Yitzhak Rabin Square or anywhere else? to some shopping center and people see you and they go, oh, I just looked at this person. I actually can't feel better, right? Even without noticing that, that was the trigger, okay? So just to give you um, that kind of example of these aspirations. So always directed at others, always, right? That's there. So like, it's not just done with like, what did you do in the morning? What did you do in the evening? Or maybe if you say, no, it's all day long others. It's all day long. So. Right now, I'm, I'm translating into German these books on, on science and, and philosophy um, in Buddhism in the classical text. And there's a, there's a foreword by uh, Tupton Jimba. And I remember he said something so beautiful. He said, I want to uh, thank his holiness because he's always there just for all sentient beings in the world. That's all he says about his holiness. Because his holiness is so concerned. I think that I'm not sure these were his exact words, but I was like, Wow, that's really summarizes his wholeness. It's really like, of course, his wholeness has this incredible wisdom and understanding, all that. But really, this deep care for other sentient beings all the time. So really, that's what it means to be a Bodhisattva. That's what it's like. There's just others. And it's so deep and it's so strong. It's so much greater than the love of a mother for a child. And, and that on a, on, a, on a worldly level is amazing. Or a father for his, his child. That's an amazing love. But it's so much deeper. It goes so much deeper towards all sentient beings. So I think that becomes maybe a little bit clearer with this aspiration. So it's not just good old prayer, just saying a few prayers and thinking of anything, but the, the meaning of the words, but it goes deeper. Anyway, sorry, I didn't want to mean they wouldn't want to spend that much time on this, but it, it's not mentioned enough. It's not mentioned enough. Okay. Anyway, so therefore the aspirations become perfectly refined. The perfection of aspiration or prayers, it's sometimes called, which is really a form of aspiration. So then he'll be roused. But what happens is the Bodhisattva now reaches the state where there's no longer self-grasping. There's no longer self-centeredness. They're gone for good. And I don't know whether it's necessary, but just to be safe, the Bodhisattvas rouse, the Buddha, sorry, rouse the Buddha. So some kind of, I don't know, mind communication, whatever it is, to basically, in, in, that, in that, that meditative absorption, somehow they're able to move the mind of the Bodhisattva. And I don't know how that happens. It's only just mentioned that they rouse the Bodhisattva from the cessation, from the state of being absorbed in emptiness, but also in that cessation, because they've reached the cessation of samsara. They've, they've overcome samsara in the sense that no longer the root cause of samsara is gone. So it's very tempting, I guess, I guess for anyone to remain in that state. And actually Bodhisattvas, of course, they're driven by their love and their compassion, but the Buddhas, I guess, kind of rouse them anyway. That's, it's mentioned here. So really it's like that, it's good to get that little kick from the Bodhisattvas. Hey, come on, don't, don't rest in that. I know it's blissful. I know it's wonderful. It's this incredible, but sentient beings, you need to work hard, you know, work further to become fully enlightened. Anyway, it's mentioned here, roused by the Bodhisattvas. So, therefore, roused by, sorry, roused by the Buddhas. The Bodhisattva is roused by the Buddhas from the cessation. After they attain the meditative equipoise, it eliminates the subtlest 
innate afflictive obstructions. Okay, so basically if overcome whatever needs to be overcome in order to attain liberation. They're liberated, totally. No more afflictions, totally gone. There were subtler ones before, and I don't know whether they actually manifest. Yes, to a certain degree, subtle attachment maybe. I mean, it didn't last long. It'd be tiny, be very short, but it's still there. Now that's totally gone. All right. And so in his commentary, Lama Tsongkhapa actually cites the Ten Ground Sutra. And he just, he says, like, once you reach that level, it's kind of like it, things become so effortless because the self-grasping is gone, the self-centeredness is gone. So he gives this beautiful kind of analogy saying, it's like when you have a sailing board, a uh, sailing boat that you want to get to the ocean, you have to man manually get it to the ocean. So that requires a lot of hard work, maybe pull it through the, 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 the well, either get it from the beach to the, to the ocean or maybe uh, pull it through a river that takes you to the ocean. So it requires a lot of effort. But once you're on the ocean, you sail effortlessly. So it's like that. Previous, while you still had afflictions, while the Bodhisattva still had afflictions, it's it's not effortless. It's not that effortless. But once they're gone on the on the eighth level, ah, smooth sailing. Um, actually, this is this expression even in English? So the smooth sailing, as in things have become so much smoother. Okay, and then in verse uh, number two of the eighth chapter. So I hope the other one was clear now. So they attain the state and attain the state of irresolvability or immovability. Then they're aroused. Aspiration is excelling. So that was what verse one tells us. Verse two gives us the reason now why they're aroused. Okay, I've already given that to you, but it's given here because the afflictions were eliminated. So free of attachment. Now the Bodhisattva um, is free of attachment. His or her mind no longer remains with faults that prevent liberation from Nirvana. And so all afflictive stains are completely destroyed on the eighth ground along with their roots. Okay, so no more fault in terms of, uh, well, at least afflictive obscurations, all gone. And with the affliction cease, they, the Bodhisattva becomes unrivaled in the three realms, the samsaric realms. So in, in comparison to ordinary samsaric beings, unrivaled. Of course, there are those liberated beings now with regard to having overcome these, um, they're pretty similar to these who have become self-liberated. But of course, what's so, what's so different from them is this incredible love and compassion they have for sentient beings. So they don't stop there, um, continue right away. Yet a Buddha's boundless space-like resources are still beyond his reach. So therefore they rouse them. The, the, they rouse them. It's like, yeah, they've reached the state and they're so blissful. So kind of somehow mentally communicating with the Bodhisattva, Come on, more work to be done. Okay, so, um, and so though samsara has now ceased, of course, then on that level, the, um, it goes on to say, so although the, for that Buddha, existence in samsara through contaminated karma and affliction has completely ceased, um, of course, they were very much controlled by love and compassion, but it was still an aspect there um, that didn't, in any way obstruct them the way they obstruct us, but still it was there. Now it's totally gone. So although so although for the Bodhisattva, the existence in samsara has completely ceased, they still display himself for samsaric beings through diverse forms. So this manifests on the basis of a mental body, different emanations. They've already done that previously, but now it's totally without... Um, previously, it was done also through um, using the um, the obscurations. Using the obscurations, they were utilized. But here, well, at least the afflictive ones, they're totally gone. It was through the imprints they were used. But anyway, here it's just this pure mental body. And I don't know so much about this. It's really difficult here. This and, and I've asked many of my teachers and I've never really received an answer because emanations were already... The Bodhisattva emanated different beings already on the path of seeing. Um, so it's not really clear how this mental, the mental body, so the, the, the mental consciousness, how it is so different 
emanating beings as opposed to on the path of seeing, okay? Except to say, well, there's no longer any self-grasping. That's definitely gone. Anyway, I can't tell you much more about it. Like I said, I've, my teachers have never really been able to say much more about it. I haven't found anything in the commentaries. But anyway, so it does say in Amazon Kappa's commentary that now on the base of the mental body, there are different emanations, totally free from self-centeredness. They're able to still benefit other sentient beings. And this ability of diverse, uh, diverse forms to emanate these diverse forms is through having attained 10 controlling powers, right? So they're just mentioned. And if you read the commentary, it tells you more about these powers. It's their powers is mentioned again in the next chapter, but here are 10 where it talks about uh, the power. And this is described in the Sri Maladevi Sutra and also cited in the 10 ground sutra. So it refers to on that ground, the Bodhisattva attains control over lifespan, mind, material resources, action, birth, aspiration, intention, supernatural feats, wisdom, and Dharma. Okay. But this is where it becomes a little bit difficult because when you look at these, when you look at these in the commentary, they're a little bit more explained in, in uh, illuminating the intent. The question arises, well, in what way weren't they attained before? This is where studying these grounds can be a little bit difficult because it's very hard to see when some of these qualities are mentioned. Well, how's it different to previous to the previous qualities? With wisdom and the object being emptiness, to a certain degree, yeah, you can say, well, previously it was realized, wasn't realized, now it is realized. Previously, it was only conceptually realized, now it's directly realized. But in particular, when it comes to other aspects, like their powers becoming stronger, their love becoming stronger, like I said earlier, it's like, how do you measure it? Like, how do you say it's stronger on this level and stronger on that level? So it's, it's, it's not that easy. They're mentioned here, but they always give rise to a debate, these unrivaling powers or 10 controlling powers, sorry, these 10 controlling powers, in what way are they there now when they haven't been there before? That debate could certainly arise, but without going into this, and you can debate endlessly on that, um, that was the explanation, definitely. So there are these 10 controlling powers that a Bodhisattva reaches on that level. I've just mentioned them, and in more detail, uh, you can read through them um, in the commentary. All right, I, I'm afraid I was pretty fast. I went through it quite quickly again. Um, I hope I wasn't speaking too quickly or too fast. But just to briefly um, summarize what we talked about, well, we've now finally left the sixth chapter behind us. I went slowly, or I went briefly through these last three verses where Chandrakirti mentions, well, wisdom, of course, the understanding of emptiness is the result of understanding what he previously explained. But of course, method is also an important part because without method, the two wings um, of the Bodhisattva or the two wings of method and wisdom, if they were not there, the Bodhisattva could not reach enlightenment. So having mentioned that, then uh, during the seventh chapter, we learn why it's uh, what, what happens in what way the Bodhisattva outshines on the eighth level, on the seventh level, outshines practitioners um, of the self liberation path. And then on the eighth ground, very important, we learned that the Bodhisattva reaches liberation, eliminates the subtlest obscurations. Uh, to liberation, to, 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 yeah, to liberation, the subtlest types and becomes liberated, is roused by the Buddhas from that cessation because it's so extremely blissful that um, even though there's no attachment whatsoever, but there may still be that tendency to remain longer than necessary and therefore aroused by the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Of course, their own love and compassion would definitely uh, not keep them long in that. Um, state of enjoying that blissful cessation, but still, uh, even without attachment, we have a tendency, we, we 
we enjoy blissful states a buddha does so too even without attachment um, there will still be a tendency of the mind to remain, remain longer than necessary and therefore they're aroused from that state at the same time we also heard about the aspiration when arising from the meditative equipoise in terms of the 10 perfections the aspiration the bodhisattva excels in the aspiration and of course um, now no longer being in samsara having overcome samsara still of course manifesting uh, through their mental body and again I'm, it's, no one really had been able to explain me what is that mental body in what way does it manifest it's just always mentioned yigilu, it's always mentioned but it's not mentioned how exactly the whole process takes place so anyway uh, through prayer and so forth so i don't want to go into this right now um anyway still manifesting for the benefit of sentient beings and of course having attained what are called the 10 controlling powers that also gives the bodhisattva the special ability of course to continuously work towards for, work for sentient beings but also continuously move closer to enlightenment all right so that should be enough for today um, I'll continue with the ninth and tenth chapter and the eleventh chapter. There's not much on nine and ten for next time, and we start with the eleventh chapter. Um, and now it's definitely a little faster. Well, let's see. I always say that, and then it isn't. Um, but yeah, we're nearing the end. Okay, so all that's left to do is for us to do a short meditation. How can we reflect on that? How can we? internalize what we've learned today so let's do this together starting of course with some breathing meditation so to just focus on the breath and let go of any disruptive thoughts just be totally focused on the subject So however difficult or even impossible it may seem to us right now, eventually we will also reach the different grounds that we've been discussing here. Our love, compassion, and our bodhicitta. We'll get ever stronger. And in that way, strengthen our direct realization of emptiness. We will attain.
maintain the different boomies. Excel in generosity. Ethical discipline. Patience. Enthusiastic effort. Concentration and wisdom. And then attain the seventh boomy. which our direct realization of emptiness that mind that directly experiences emptiness has become so agile that we can enter and exit within a single moment to that direct experience. Similarly, we excel in skillful means in our skill to teach the Dharma and guide others. And once we reach that level, all that is left of the afflictive obscurations in our mind. All that is left of our self-grasping is the subtlest possible level of it. Which we can overcome and and that way reach the eighth bumi, the eighth ground. So we attain a meditative equipoise. That eliminates a subtlest afflict of obscuration. And therefore eliminates our samsara.
causing us to experience such bliss that the Buddhas themselves will rouse us from our meditative equipoise to not remain longer absorbed in that cessation than necessary. And with all self-grasping and self-centeredness completely gone, our love, our compassion, and our determination to Come enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. Will grow even stronger. So strong that we excel in the perfection of aspiration or aspiration of prayer. making our existence even more beneficial for sentient beings. Therefore being able to benefit others in an even profounder way than previously. And now with all our contaminated karma and afflictions completely gone, we manifest in different ways based on our mental body and through having gained the 10 controlling powers such as the power of lifespan and so forth.
So such is the power of our mind. That is just a matter of time and effort. We can reach these levels of a bodhisattva. So now to conclude this short reflection on what we learned today, spend a few moments to just single pointlessly focus on whichever insights you've gained through this reflection and allow for it to absorb deeper into your mind. And then let's dedicate all the positive potential we accumulated together. May this, of course, come across for us to develop the different path and different grounds in our own mind. To eventually attain the awakened state of a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. But may our virtue also cause the lives of our lamas, of our spiritual guides, like his home is the Dalai Lama, to be extremely long and healthy. So that they continue to teach us through their example and through their wise words. May our virtue also affect all the beings around us on this planet in a positive way. May it cause love and compassion to rise in the minds of those who are responsible for all the armored conflicts going on right now. May it reduce the sufferings of war. May those who are sick, like Tisha Punsok and Tali Lubin, recover very soon. Of course, may our merit affect sentient beings in the way expressed by Shantideva. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. 
May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I true remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Okay, thank you very much. And just a reminder Thanks. for this coming week, sorry, um, just a reminder for this coming week, please continue with bodhicitta. Do not give up. If anything, strengthen it. Make an extra effort. And of course, bring it together with whatever understanding you have of subtle impermanence, of that constant change of every situation, uh, of every, well, sentient being, our mind, others' minds, suffering, happiness, and so forth. So bring the two together, as I mentioned in the very beginning. And have a great week. Uh, and see you Thank again. You. Uh, see you again Thank next week. Thank, so Thank, Thank you, Geshe Ma. Bye bye. Thank you, Geshe Ma. Good night. Good night. Bye. Thank you, Geshe Ma. Thank you. Thank you, Dharma Thank you very friends. much. Thank you, Dharma Thank friends. You much. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you, Thank you everybody, for joining us. Thank you. Happy Passover. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.